Okay, uh, good morning. A little, little earlier in the morning for some people than others. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give, uh, I'll start out by saying that uh, AMSAT NA, we seem to have a lot going on right now. Uh, we're stretched pretty thin. I've got 60 slides. We're going to go fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, th this is what we call a 40,000 foot view. You know, this is looking out the window at the, at the ground going by underneath. The Fox One project. I've been talking to you about Fox for a couple of years now. Uh, <laughs> we're in orbit. <laughs> it's, it's been a, a, a real ride. Uh, this started out as we wanted to build one CubeSat, get it to LEO however we could with just an FM repeater. And now it's grown into university experiments that are riding along with us and helping pay for the launch. Uh, and the new Fox satellites, uh, one Cliff and one Delta, uh, we're even, even adding uh, L-band receive uplink capabilities on them. So it's, it's really come a long way since uh, I guess it's been close to 10 years ago when we finally decided to do a CubeSat. This was an interesting uh, graph that was published here recently. It, almost 50% failure rate for CubeSats. We, we've done really well, both AMSAT UK and AMSAT NA, that we haven't had any of these problems. Uh, and that should be a point of pride for all of us. This is a picture of the Fox 1 stack. Uh, you'll notice the upper four boards are all marked EXP for experiment. That's all extra room in our bus that we can uh, fly experiments. And these experiments are generally with a university partner, one or more. And that uh, helps us get the uh, CubeSat launch initiative rides in the US. And then as you move down, you see our battery board, power supply, IHU, and receiver and transmitter on the bottom. This is the top board uh, out of Cliff. Not a whole lot in this one uh, because it's, it's not needed. Oh, that moved by itself. Uh, this is the, uh, the next one down the, in the experiment board. This is the Vanderbilt. This is on autoplay. Let me back up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you borrow somebody else's presentation and modify it at the last minute. Uh, this is the Vanderbilt uh, uh, RAM board. This is their radiation experiment uh, where they're testing these uh, uh, different microchips. Uh, as we move down, this is the controller for that board. And you'll notice, um, <laughs> I like the comment earlier about the uh, doing everything differently and on our own. Um, what do you guys see different in that than most CubeSat boards? The connector? This is the, the stack connector. You'll see that in all the boards. We're using a different connector, which um, comes Gives us a lot more real estate, but it comes with other issues too, like we can't go out and buy an EPS at the last minute um, to use if something happens. This is our battery board. Yes, they are NICADs. Yes, they are obsolete. Yes, they will do four times as many cycles as your batteries will. So that's why we've stuck with those. Unfortunately, the other side of that coin is that that cell is no longer available. So after Fox 1E, we will be redesigning the battery board. This is the, uh, the PowerPoint or maximum PowerPoint conversion tracking power supply. Uh, this was uh, built by the Salmi brothers uh, as a started out as a, a college project, and they've uh, it's not flying in Fox 1A in 85, but uh, Cliff and Delta and Bravo and Echo will all have it. This is the IHU. You can see uh, some shielding there added. And things are, uh, still got a lot of room on there too. This is the, uh, one of the, the receive board. This is the receiver board and you see a nice, uh, 
on some of the shielding there, you'll see the uh, inscription. Um, and remember, it's a Tony who, uh, who started us off down this uh, CubeSat path. And there's the transmitter board underneath it. So that's, uh, that's the entire stack. It's all laid out side by side. You'll notice the, uh, I failed to mention it earlier, the notch up top and then the camera. I think this, it moved through it. That's the camera for the, uh, the VT camera. There's the hardware to put it all together. Stacked up, got our remove before flight pin and our RF connector going up to the top antenna. You see the bar magnet on the side there. Another angle. So uh, we went through environmental testing for uh, Cliff and Delta not too long ago in Orlando back in uh, February. We got some pictures for that. There's 1A without the panels on. Here's uh, our testing team. That's uh, Bob Davis, Burns Fisher, Lou McFadden, Dave Jordan, and Ed Chrome in the facility. And you see it mounted on the vibe table there up front. This is after testing Bob, uh, checking everything out. And everybody happy after the functional test passed. This was all done in a local hotel room. This is getting ready for the uh, thermal vac. There's it in the jar under testing. And everybody waiting around for it to finish. And once we were done, packed it up and shipped it off to be integrated. That was done in Cal Poly. This is for the AO85 launch. You see Jerry there on the, uh, the left. We were in the bottom of the pea pod and we had ARC1 and Bison sat going in above us. They all laid out together. And going in. And again, the uh, RBF tag. And there we are with all the other uh, CubeSats that launched on that mission all clustered together. So this, this whole uh, cluster was bolted onto the aft, uh, aft end of the uh, upper stage. So we launched on October 8th after a couple of delays. Uh, this was a NRO Atlas V out of Vandenberg, um, NRO 55 big top secret satellite up top. Uh, we were really restricted on what we could say um, about just about everything. So please excuse us if there were, were a lack of details leading up to the launch, including the exact launch time. We ended up in a 518 by 810 kilometer orbit, which is just at the hairy edge of a 25 year lifetime. Appreciate that. Uh, that's a 810 kilometers is about the best that we can expect uh, within orbital debris guidelines with the type of launches we're getting now. 65 degree inclination. Oh, this is always a challenge to see if this will work. Well, this is the P-Pod deployment. Launch video didn't seem to work. So the first, uh, first part is real time. See the door open, we came out pretty fast. This is one eighth speed. So we got this, uh, I think it was the next day. I mean, we had already heard signals by then, but it was nice to have video evidence. Let me see if I can get the um, this one to work. This 
is what happens when you, there we go. It was a YouTube video, so I had to um, record it with the new function in PowerPoint that I hadn't used before. This is from the NRO office, so there's a lot of propaganda in there with it. So uh, several of us, uh, I didn't get to go, but uh, Jerry and uh, I think Burns and a couple other people, including Tony's widow and daughter, got to go and watch the launch live. I'm sorry, we don't have any sound on it. Perfect launch. Of course, as soon as it gets up to a certain altitude, they stop talking publicly about anything. And then we go back to the propaganda. Uh, I'll stop it here. You get to see the presentation again. So uh, we heard it very soon. I think the first station to to send any uh, telemetry in was in um, Russia and it started coming in pretty quick. We were all very happy that everything worked. Um, after nine months, here's what we can tell you. The battery is working very well. Uh, we've not had any low battery uh, issues, trips um, since it's been up, which is uh, surprising because being in the, the orbit we're in, we go from full sun to fairly long eclipse uh, periods. Um, and the temperatures are much warmer than we expected. Much, much warmer. Like 30 degrees warmer. Uh, it's not a problem, although some of the IHU temperatures, the internal temperatures on the IHU are a little scary because they're up 60 degrees C. Uh, but that's inside the chip. So uh, the rest of the temperatures run 20, 25, somewhere around there. Uh, we, good thing about that is we don't have to run the battery heaters. We do have battery heaters on it because we were expecting to be close to, to zero. Um, so we don't need those. That's all the extra power for the downlink. Uh, the Vanderbilt radiation experiment is working really well. This is the experiment is running full time. Uh, it comes down, the, the telemetry data comes down in the subaudible tones uh, in the low speed telemetry. Uh, so the more the people, more people use the repeater on it, while somebody else is listening to copy telemetry, the better for us because it's, um, that's where we get our, our telemetry from. Uh, Vanderbilt's very excited about it. Uh, we've got several other projects ongoing with them, so it's, it's turned out to be a very good relationship. Uh, from both sides of the fence. Uh, the MEMS gyro data is, we're still looking at it. Um, it seems reasonable. Uh, there was some concern because um, the helium purge prior to launch, helium is, gets in everywhere and messes things up. And they were a little wonky for a while after that, but it seems to have went back to normal. I'm sure it comes out just as fast as it goes in, especially in a vacuum. So uh, usage-wise, I am an operations guy and not a technical guy. Uh, I can tell you that this satellite is very easy to hear. Any, everybody in here tried to listen for it? Two meters and you don't need anything. You got a wet noodle, jam it in the SMA connection, uh, you'll hear it. Um, 145.98, program it in. You don't have to worry about Doppler shift on the downlink because it's on two meters. It's, it's not much. Uh, and it, it's very strong. We have had a receive issue. Um, the flight model, the antenna for the uplink broke and it was repaired in order to make our launch. Uh, the repair used some epoxy 
and we think that maybe we detune part of the antenna circuit with that epoxy. Uh, it takes a decent signal to get in if you're not careful. If you optimize your method of operation, you can get in with 5 watts and an HT. Um, if you look down in the bottom left there, Fernando MP4JV uh, works with just an arrow and an HT, and he can work it down to 2 degrees on some passes. The problem here, it's not a problem, the, the complexity here is a lot of people are using an arrow antenna. You've got your 2 meter elements and your 70 centimeter elements. They're 90 degrees out of phase. Uh, the antennas on Fox are both linear whips and they're out opposite directions, so they're in the same plane. When you peak your arrow on, your, on the satellite for receive, you're 20 dB down on uplink because you're 90 degrees out or some number around there. So if you're using an arrow, when you go to transmit, just twist 90 degrees. Your downlink might not be as good, but you'll get in better. And then when you go back to receive, just go back. Uh, or use an elk. <laughs> the elks are in, in, in line uh, since you're, it's a log periodic. So uh, it, we are making contacts with it. It's not as sensitive as we hoped, and hopefully on the next ones we won't have that problem. The footprint's great too. Uh, at Apogee, you know, we're covering the entire U.S. and a good part of Canada and Central and uh, Central America. Uh, I have noticed the Apogee is drifting. It used to be over the U.S., uh, over the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Apogee is drifting uh, right now on the ascending passes. Apogee is close to the equator and Perigee is on the descending passes. So it'll drift around and Australia and New Zealand and South America and South Africa will get their turn with a good apogee. Fox One Cliff, next in the series to be launched. Um, originally Fox One C, when Cliff K7RR passed away, he left us a, a considerable gift and we decided to rename the satellite after him. Uh, so we try to refer to it as Fox One Cliff now. Uh, this satellite will fly the uh, maximum power point tracking uh, system for the first time. It'll have uh, the Penn State uh, MEMS gyro, which is actually built into our IHU, so it'll be there. We'll have another Vanderbilt radiation experiment. We'll have uh, Virginia Tech camera will fly on this one. And we'll have the L-band uplink. Um, we call it the downshifter board. Uh, that takes uh, the L-band uplink and converts it to UHF. Uh, that will be an either-or situation. Uh, we'll be able to, it'll either be the UHF uplink or the L-band uplink, but not both at once. Uh, and right now I think we've got it set up where L-band runs for a certain amount of time and then reverts to U-band, just in case we can't command it on L-band. Fox 1D is a uh, Close to the same uh, satellite as 1C, uh, this came up uh, as an opportunity to fly another satellite on short notice. Uh, the main difference is that instead of the Vanderbilt experiment, we're carrying a University of Iowa um, high energy radiation CubeSat instrument. It was in my notes. <laughs> I can never remember that acronym. Both of these have passed environmental testing. They are uh, sitting in a uh, Pelican case in Texas, waiting to be delivered and integrated into the quad pack. Uh, I think everybody knows what that PEITA acronym is. We had to get a camera license for both of the cameras. Um, I had to assure NOAA that my ground station was secured lockable. Um, luckily my wife is now a U.S. citizen so that's problem's been ameliorated, uh, fixed. Um, I have to volunteer for involuntary inspections of the ground station which is interesting since it's in my den. Um, the, we, we got a waiver uh, to not have to encrypt the downlink so everybody else can see what the pictures have in it. Um, we have to only take pictures of the earth, which 
could be difficult with a satellite with no active attitude control. So we're going to take pictures, but not download pictures that don't have the planet in them. Yeah, these rules need updating ASAP. Of course, I have a feeling a lot of other camera projects aren't actually going through this in the US. Uh, launching after C and D, but coming before. Switch, switch to slide back, so it's a bit bigger. Sure. Now you get to see it a third time. Don't we all love PowerPoint? Oh. Fox 1B. This is uh, another satellite that we're launching through the uh, CubeSat Launch Initiative program. Again, we're working with Vanderbilt. Uh, it'll be another radiation experiment. Uh, we've just this week been doing testing uh, leading up to the um, uh, environmental testing, and that will be launched on January 20th. Sun synchronous orbit, uh, it's a Delta II out of Vandenberg, I think the second to the last Delta II, maybe the last Delta II. Um, I can't tell you the orbit, but it's going to be good. Rad, effect, Rad effect Sat 2, Fox 1E, um, again with Vanderbilt. Uh, we submitted the proposal in November, uh, was, yeah, November 2015. Uh, it was accepted uh, in 2016. Uh, we've been offered a launch. Uh, it's not final yet, but uh, probably 2018 timeframe. Uh, it's going to be very similar to Rad Effect Sat, but testing different chips. Uh, and instead of flying an FM repeater this time, we're going to uh, try to have a 30 kilohertz wide uh, linear transponder. This will be opposite of the FunCube satellites. We're going to be going up on two meters and down on 70 centimeters. Uh, we've got a 1200-baud uh, uh, telemetry beacon on this one. It'll sound very similar to FunCube. Uh, we've got some other things up our sleeve that we're not ready to talk about yet, but it's going to be an interesting transponder payload. Same space frame, uh, same avionics, uh, obviously new radio. We're also working with University of Washington right now on uh, a 3U satellite that they're building. Uh, they reached out to us and asked for a, uh, a payload very similar to what uh, happened with UQ, basically a, a backup and a, uh, a means to get other telemetry data down to a wider audience. I think their primary radio is up in the gigahertz range. I uh, don't know where we're going with this one yet, uh, orbit-wise or when, but that's in the works. And we've, we've had several other people talk to us about uh, uh, doing something similar. So we may see this uh, transponder uh, show up in a lot of different payloads or a lot of different satellites. So uh, a lot of talk about going to the moon. Uh, we're actually working on the CubeSat Quest Challenge or CubeQuest Challenge with uh, uh, NASA sponsored contest type situation. Uh, we're in partnership with Ragnarok Industries uh, to build a 6U CubeSat, and they are competing for a slot on the SLS-1 mission, the first launch that'll uh, hopefully go to lunar orbit. We're basically just uh, supplying the uh, communications form, and this will be uh, a 5 and 10 gigahertz system like we've been talking about for the other projects that we're going to see. And when and if the primary mission's finished, we'll be able to use that as potentially a, a phase five satellite. AMSAT ground terminal. Uh, this is the other end of that equation. This is what we're working on so people will be able to use all these five and ten gigahertz satellites. Uh, five and dime is the, the nickname that has been given. Uh, it's an SDR based design. Uh, it, since it's separated from the, uh, the space segment, uh, we can work on it in the open and talk to people that aren't U.S. citizens about it. Uh, right now, it may be involved in, well, it's going to be involved in the CQC, it may be involved in P3E, we may involve it in another HEO project, and it will most definitely be involved in, in Phase 4B. Uh, we're targe targeting $1,000 or less for the complete ground station. 
Uh, right now they've got a uh, test set up in California where we're basically putting it up on a water tower on a high mountain and uh, calling it a ground sat and we'll be able to uh, test everything out with that there. Phase 4B announced uh, I think one year ago here. Uh, we've got a uh, an opportunity to fly along on a the wide field of view satellite. Uh, this is still ongoing. This is primarily a VT, uh, Virginia Tech project, uh, led by uh, Bob McGuire and 4HY. Uh, it'll be a primary, primarily digital, but also possibly analog transponder. Five gig up, ten down. Um, this is right out of. I have to be very careful what I say on this, so this is right out of Bob's slides that are up uh, on the VT website. I would encourage everybody to jot that address at the bottom down, www.hume.vt.edu forward slash geo. Uh, there's a lot of stuff put up there uh, if you're interested in the project uh, that goes into a lot greater detail than I can. Uh, the digital transponder will the goal is 100 uh, channels, um, 100 channels uplink to the satellite and one uh, shared downlink, uh, FDMA. And uh, this is primarily being pushed as an emergency communications resource. Uh, right now the ARRL has said that they'd like to have 100 terminals to be able to distribute in case of an emergency. Uh, that we can be first on the air to, uh, to help with communications in and out of the disaster zone. This is the heart of the payload. This is Rincon Research, who's graciously donated this particular piece of hardware. This is the Astro SDR, and there's lots and lots of data on it up on that uh, Hume website. We will also take what we've learned from the CQC and from P4B and ground terminal uh, and hopefully apply that towards a three or six U HEO. Uh, we're looking for partners in it and this is kind of operating uh, in the background um, when people don't, aren't tied up with the P4B and the P3E um, progress. Uh, hopefully we'll put a CSLI proposal in this year or early next year for it. We continue to get uh, lots of opportunities to go to LEO. Uh, it's gotten to the point where we can be a little picky about it. Um, you know, obviously the, the ISS type orbits are, um, there's a lot of them out there right now. It's not the, the most attractive orbit communications wise, but uh, we're looking at that and everything above it. Uh, some of the upgrades that we want to do is probably go to a 3U bus. Uh, we're looking at it using uh, SDX, SDR technology instead of uh, analog hardware transponders. Uh, still looking for hosted experiments and especially anybody that's interested in helping with attitude control or propulsion. So, 60 slides, a lot of jibber jabber. Anybody got any questions? I might or might not be able to ask, answer them. Wow. <laughs> it's lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you.